Hi, and welcome back to the Mortgage Broker Broadcast. My guest this week is Vadim Toda from Proportunity. Vadim is the owner, creator, co-founder, CEO of Proportunity. And the reason why I wanted to get him onto the podcast was he has to talk about Proportunity and what it is and explain exactly as a product and its journey, its history, and get to know him a lot more. But the interesting thing for me was how he's looking to change the mortgage market world, the mortgage world in the UK. And who better to talk about that than Vadim? So let's just get him onto the podcast. Vadim, welcome to the podcast. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I am great. Uh, excited about this. Good. Now, I'm excited as well because somebody from out, so technically who's not a mortgage broker, but obviously looking at bringing it into the mortgage broker world. And yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. Like we've had a brief chat before we hit record. We've got no agenda set. We're just going to have a very conversation about you, get to know you a lot more about your background and and then moving on to opportunity, what it is, get all those sorts of things into the mix. And yeah, who knows where this is going to go, but I, I'm very appreciative that you sort of trusted me to, uh, to, to guide you, like to, to go through this. So, uh, Brilliant. That's it. just appreciate your time. So, first of all, do you want to give sort of people a bit of a background, a history about you and what you've been doing and, and up to date, really? Sure, sure, sure. Um, so, hi everyone. I'm uh, Vadim Toader, um, the son of two Romanian engineers, entrepreneurs. Um, I am currently the CEO and co founder of Proportunity, which is a uh, bank of mom and dad as a service lender. We top up people's um, mortgages with an extra second charge mortgage, allowing them to buy a slightly bigger house or maybe buy a bit earlier. Um, Kind of rode into the mortgage market, started six years ago, almost. Well, yeah, in September, November, six years since we started Proportunity. Uh, But like, yeah, we, this whole mission was, kind of in, into my brain um, in about 2013, so almost 10 years ago, when I got my first job and my parents said, stop throwing money down the drain on rent and get a property. And like any geek, I tried to find homes that I liked by downloading them from Zoopla, putting them in Excel, mashing them against like rental prices in the area, tried to get some sort of discount arbitrage. I had like a hundred and I started seeing them and they sent me to brokers. And when I talked to my first broker, just ruined my dreams because I remember I could afford about 200K, had a salary of 39,000 and 20K deposit. And uh, yeah, I thought I could get a 300K property, but they said, no, you can only borrow five times or four and a half. And that's it. And uh, yeah, I felt really, uh, and that, that kind of stuck. Because I felt like, okay, I went to the best university I could and I got one of the hardest jobs I could earning above national average, have a deposit. I've done everything the world said I had to do to get a house and I can't get a house. And so that was um, that kind of stuck. And yeah, that's what, as an engineer, led me to create opportunities to try to uh, help people get past that because I feel it's a bit of a, um, I don't know, it just feels like it's quite a dangerous thing. Um, for the future generations, right? Because at the moment you have bank of mom and dad helping people to get on the ladder. But if I'm gonna be someone's bank of mom and dad, and I and I am actually, we had a kid like nine months ago and I can't buy a house, how am I gonna help them buy a house later on, right? So I think the solution that a lot of people are counting on today might not be available in the future, right? If house prices keep going up. So um, we're working hard to fix that. I think the the beauty of that is that when you, because you've experienced it and felt that sort of that stumbling block, that the blocker in terms of what you're looking to do and what you wanted to achieve, is then yeah. how do we fix that? Is that sort of like the engineering sort of back like background? Is that sort of like I've got to fix this then now? Yeah, kind of like I've always seen engineering as you try to solve a problem. Right, and you always try to leave the world a bit better than it was before you got there and try to make use of what tools you have to create something that works. And I think as a Romanian engineer, maybe <laughs> you take no for an answer slightly harder because <laughs> it's like you and we were born, right? It was right after, I was born right 1990, a few months after communism. So there was 
there was never enough stuff going around to get everyone to be able to do what they wanted, right? So you always kind of improvise. And that was just normal, right? Uh, and I think that is quite a nifty tool in um, uh, engineering, right? To try to make a uh, make, make do with what you have, but not by lowering your expectations, just trying to be a bit innovative in how you get there. And um, yeah, we, we, my co-founder is also an engineer, he is the CTO, and we kind of carried that mentality and we were completely oblivious to mortgages when we started. Well, I guess that's not quite true. He bought a place and in Amsterdam before, and I had been working in um, financial consulting for a few, like strategy consulting, but advising banks and companies that were acquiring other companies. So I knew a thing or two about finance, but I had never applied it to my own personal finance. And um, because we were kind of out of the box, we just kept asking why, why does it have to be like this? Why can't you buy? And uh, um, yeah, like a cool thing happened. So when I met my wife in 2016, this was like the, when the problem became the solution. Um, Cause I think it's not just seeing the problem and getting irked. I think that gives you passion to fight. But I think what gives you belief that you need to actually achieve it is when you see this, it's kind of like mentoring, when you see someone doing it in a different way and you're like, oh, okay, I know that's possible. So I, so, and um, you have the fuel to the fire and the vision. Uh, we bought a, we were two of us. So my wife, when we met, we had like two incomes and we were trying to buy our first property and uh, she worked in finance. So we are not rich. So we wanted to make sure we choose something that kind of grows over time. And long story short, we found something on, we asked some friends, we asked, we found something on the outskirts of a major city and uh, we bought it just over Christmas. And um, in August, we got an unsolicited offer just because some executive moved to the area and was using the same agent. And they gave us an offer to buy it for 60% more. Right? So we buy it for like 500 and 510 and they wanted to buy it for 800. Right. Wow. So for me, it was like, OK, great. <laughs> uh, and it was it was partly because we did our research. Right. But it was also mesmerizing to see how real estate can move this much. Right. And uh, looking back, it was it made sense because the area had like a cross rail. So you could get from the outskirts where we were to the city center financial part in 20 minutes. And right. but the price delta was huge. City center was like a million for a studio. The neighboring to the city center was like 800K, like the first, let's say, range of suburbs were like 800K for a two bed. And then we were like 500K for a seven bedroom with a two car garage, right? Um, so the, it was like super cheap compared to uh, the city center, but the delta in time was very small. So it kind of, and plus like used to be a bad crime where we were, but it had massively improved. And now there was like building like crazy. So all the signs were there. And um, yeah, that's kind of when we, we I thought about opportunity because on one hand, I was I like um, <laughs> sometimes competition also helps. I was like, my wife found this house. So I was like, all right, let's see if I can find a better house. Like that's even better. <laughs> so like, let's get an so algorithm. Even competitive with your wife then. Of course. That's what like, you start saying. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it's just like out of place, right? Um, and we, I realized like I need an algorithm, right? Because what I had, I had realized two things. On one hand was the data is there, but no one's really looking at it. Or if they are, they're keeping it to themselves and they're doing it very local. Because from my perspective in the area we bought, it wasn't the house that had grown that much. It was just the whole area had like exploded. And because no, our house was not special. We didn't negotiate on it much. It was like the number three out of top 10 we selected. So every house in that area grew, right? Just a pound per square meter grew. And um, we calculated that if it was like 300K per home and there were like a thousand homes, it was like 300 million being created, right? So we're like, okay, what other neighborhoods are seeing these things, right? What, uh, where can we get the data and find other neighborhoods? Because it clearly people aren't reporting this, right? Because when we saw how fast it exploded, we were expecting to be all over the news, right? Everyone was shouted from, come here, this is the new Peckham, the new Camberwell, the new whatever. Um, but they weren't. So I realized that, that it's not really studied, it's not really understood. And yourself today, right? If you're trying to figure out, like in, in private equity, if you want to buy a company, 
and you're trying to figure out, I don't know, like a factory of ball bearings in Poland, what it's worth, right? You could buy reports, right? You could go online and it'd be studies of competitors, how they perform, blah, blah, blah. And they would say, hey, here's the fastest growing companies. Here's how fast they should be growing. And it's either data-based or at, at the least, it's a survey-based, right? They just go and ask experts and say, be about that much, right? In real estate, you can't get that. No, if I ask what's the fastest 100 growing neighborhoods in London, that does not exist. Not even opinion-based, right? Mm -hmm. That's the point. So, and I was like, that doesn't make sense, right? Like there should be someone that has a billion pounds to spend that wants that data. Someone should create it for it. And I think maybe there is and they're keeping it very underground, but I think most likely what it is, it's business systems focus on commercial because they buy malls or like huge swaps of building at a time. So when it comes to residential, it's more people's business and people, I don't know why, but I find it really funny that they don't care that much about what's going to happen to the price of the house. Cause you worry much more about what's going to happen to the price of your laptop or your phone. You do a lot of due diligence on that, but you have, no idea if your house is going to be up 10% or 5% or 15% next year, but you're perfectly happy spending half a million. <laughs> to me, that kind of blows my mind. Away. Well, I think that because it's very, and I get your point, it's a very, very valid point. But, and I think being in the industry it's big, and sort of seeing people when they're in that situation, is it's very emo it's, it's an emotional thing. They see the house is a very... For most people, it's an emotional thing. They don't. It's their home. They see where they're going to be yeah. eating dinner every night, going home from work, raising the kids, all those sorts of things of emotional side of things. They don't see it as a business opportunity. Is that? Yeah, I think that's. Yeah, that's right. So I think it's a case of. I know, but it's. I, I totally agree, right? But I don't think one necessarily excludes the other. No, no, right? no, absolutely, no, no, no. I'm just. And I, I, I totally get what you're saying because it is. They do, it should they should both go hand in hand with what the look what like in terms of from the way that you look at it when you're deciding your future home you should be yeah. looking at it from from a like a growth point of view exactly because it's I have emotional dinners with my wife and maybe we spend I don't know a hundred pounds two hundred pounds we go out with friends a thousand pounds on an expl explosive holiday. Right. And it's purely about the experience. You still look a bit at the prices and do some research, but that's it. But you're spending 500 grand, <laughs> right? You should be doing a bit more due diligence than, oh, I like this red door. Right. And I get yeah. it. I, I, I also totally get it. Right. You're getting married or you have a kid. There's a thousand other things going through your head. You're bombasted with this mortgage stuff that you've never done before and solicitors. And then I, I, I've seen it. We've held like a few hundred first time buyers and talk to like thousands. So we get that. But I, I think the reason they don't do it is because their parents didn't do it because their brothers didn't do it because, and it's okay. They turned out okay. Cause house prices always kind of go up. So overall you're like, okay, it's, and, and they're also, cause there is no easy way to do it. Right? Like everyone loves yeah. checking Zoopla's house price cause it exists. If they would have to pay a hundred quid for it and there would be only one provider, maybe they wouldn't do it, right? Uh, so it's that point about making the info available because fundamentally the link of why I'm obsessed about it is because it's, I don't think it's that hard. If you think about forecasting, it's, it's and my team's going to kill me, but it is hard. It is bloody hard, especially when you're a startup and you're a team of like a handful of people. But I think compared to like forecasting stock prices, or the weather or things that shift a lot more daily. I think this isn't that hard. Cause like, guess what? Everyone knows what affects house prices, right? It's train stations, it's crime rates, it's schools, it's transportation time. It's whatever neighborhood, like hipster coffee shops and stuff like that. The data exists, <laughs> it's there. <laughs> you can analyze it and it moves much slower, right? Tomorrow, whatever, or like now you see Russia gas prices, et cetera. House prices haven't shifted. Maybe they will in three months. Maybe they will in two years, right? But stuff like this has existed in the past. You can correlate it. You can know how much. You can know when. And because it moves slowly, it's more predictable. And because you care, as we just <laughs> explained, 
you should look at it, right? So if it's creatable and it's usable and you have a financial responsibility to look at it, I think these things will exist in the future. And what we try to create up opportunities first, see if you can predict, right? Or at least better understand trends, like in a very basic concept, right? People say, oh, how much my house is going to grow up because of Crossrail? Well, you could do an analysis on looking at other train stations that appeared and what was the impact on those house prices, right? Over a year or two. And you can get people some data about that, right? Uh, so we tried to create that first and then afterwards use this as a bit of a product because if this whole problem with banks asking for 20% down or whatever, or if not, you pay, your interest rate goes up through the roof, right? Or like doubles between 80 and 95%. Maybe if we can show the bank that the house is going to do well statistically, then maybe they don't need that big deposit, right? Or maybe you can borrow a bit more. That was kind of our plot, right? And uh, we, we got the data and realized convincing banks to change, especially mortgages, is hard. So then we just set up our own mortgage lender and said, okay, cool. We'll do the bit in between uh, ourselves. And um, that was fun and easy. Uh, uh, anyway, sorry. Uh, I, don't no, to, I want this to be a conversation. I don't want this to be a ramble on my side. No, 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 it's, it's good. No, no, honestly, it's good stuff because there's loads of things in my head thinking that, well, like you say, one of my frustrations with the mortgage broken industry is that, as a mortgage broker, it's about collecting data. It's collecting data from various points, but the mm -hmm. data already exists in some form. So, yeah. it all, it, and this is the similar sort of thing. So, I'm sort of thinking from an estate agent point of view, if I'm marketing a property and I can show that there's like you've got this data and it's growth and things like well, everything that like you say, house prices will they always grow, whether it that we have we hit sort of recessions or we hit bubbles or whatever that like things happen but yeah. property prices will always grow that's just that's just how it is it's the same sort of thing as with <laughs> with no, over it, a it, long period of time yeah over a long period of time yeah i'm not talk, talking about like today like within a week and within a month but over yeah, a long yeah, period yeah. of time it's it's but, on a growth it's on a growth yeah. platform it's a thing like so but even that like, if you can do much better right sorry i don't want to trip drop yeah, yeah your no, point no, about the no. agent if you get a house that's going to grow, whatever, you have a budget of 400K, let's say you're a couple, right? And you're looking at something about 400K. If you have a two bedroom flat in a gentrifying area, let's say, right? That has a decent chance of not doubling in value over five years, but growing 60%, right? From 500K, you go to 800K. Uh, or you have a, you're now, right? Like, this is a very topical question, right? Should I buy a flat in the city? Because now banks are kind of like turning Bangkok again and like maybe working from home is not quite as five days a week as we thought. Maybe it's a few days a week. Uh, so I want to be closer. Should I buy a flat in the city and have a kid here? Or should I buy a flat? Should I buy a bigger house out of the, in the, in the sticks, right? I think at least my generation in London seems to be going through this process quite a lot. If you would know that one has a high chance of growing from 500K to 800K, and then the other house you're looking at, or vice versa, doesn't have that high of a chance. From 500K, most likely you'll go to 600K. I think that's important. It's not gonna, it doesn't mean you should choose one or the other, because you're right, it's emotional, it has to be right for you. But it's important because in real estate, you have no tax, right? So if you make that 200K, you divide that by five years, that's a, a equivalent of what 40k per oh, year grand, yeah yeah post tax that's the equivalent of working a 70k job in addition to your job <laughs> while actually doing fuck all pardon my french right because real estate doesn't take any time you don't have to show up at nine and leave at five right and then at that point you are so much better right all of a sudden, maybe you can pay for better schools for your kid, or you can buy whatever car you wanted, or you can move to a bigger house in the sticks at that point, right? And this is, this is the thing, because I think people forget that property ladder is not just emotional, right? Property ladder is also a bit of a social ladder, right? You want to get some yeah. savings so you can ex escape the rat race slightly sooner or end up in a nicer position. Because it's known, right, in the financial world, it's the biggest way to create wealth over the lifetime, right? So, but that's just so understudied, right? And I think you're totally right for mortgage brokers and specifically for financial advisors. I think over the future, that should be 
an angle people look at, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, you want to invest X in real estate. How is that going to perform? What kind of real estate do you want? Let's analyze it, which one's riskier, which one's safer, right? And take that into account the same way they advise about bonds and stocks and all of that. But it's Absolutely. not, and it's funny. <laughs> and which, it, which it is, and it's a very thought-provoking topic that probably brokers don't get involved with day yeah. in day out but when you so like i'm sort of thinking now thinking like from a like a buy to let property investor kind of who, like i know quite a lot of people who buy properties rent them out buy properties rent them out this sort yeah. of data i'm trying to think i don't think the reason the data doesn't exist in a central kind of thing there might be like various other like various things going on with like local communities and stuff like that, probably there's not really one central point where this data is available. Mm-hmm. So I say, do you know, if you're in postcode L1, I'm just literally picking yeah. something off the top of my head. If you've been in that postcode and you've got a two bedroom apartment, this is how it's going to go over the next yeah. 10 years or something like that. That data is there. Yeah. It's just not kept together. But that from a, from a portfolio point of view, from a develop from a business, like somebody who owns a buy to let portfolio where I've got 10 properties and think about the next yeah. one, I care. I, the emotion's gone. I, the, there's no yeah. emotional. It's a transaction. Yeah, it's a, it's a business change. transaction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that data then is far more important to me. So the, so the estate agent part of things, I think, like you say, I totally agree with. You. I think people that are buying the first home and certainly getting the property ladder care. Like it's not so much about the they want the property for. They want a home that's obviously right. It's got some emotion mixed into yeah. it. But then I think they will be forward thinking, thinking, "This is my pension pot. This is my like. This is what I'm going to live off in forty years time, thirty years time, wherever, wherever the case may be." So people are more aware, yeah, and will become more aware. And I, I totally get your point. I, I, I think it's like there's a, a place for it with regards to all parts of the the because we as a I own a firm of mortgage brokers and we do yeah. equity release. So again, equity yeah. release with that sort of thing is like a massive. So I'm sure the data exists in yeah. some sort of guise because people are lending money based on the forecast of property prices growing. That's equity, what equity release does because people are living longer and the rest of it. So please, why don't we bring I, that forward? I don't, know. I don't know if it exists that much. Because I think what they do there is they just do a low enough LTV. They don't care because that tends to be the general approach. And then the second yeah. one, you have some of this data, right? I think Savills publishes some forecasts and so forth. But usually it's very – or they do – they take historical HPI and just drive forward and say, oh, we expect that to continue plus minus one for macro adjustment, right? Yeah. We did – Savills was, was invested in us uh, early on and we did some work with them on forecasting. And it's really funny if you take this, like, I'm sorry, don't get upset. But if you take the historical published forecast, <laughs> you check for accuracy over the last 20 years, it's just a, it's just a bet, right? Yeah. It's just a, yeah. And it's also kind of useless because if I'm trying to your perspective, right? Let's say you want to grow your bike led portfolio you, and you're looking at three houses and you're trying to pick between them, which one you select, right? If you're giving me London and... L1 and they're all in L1. How is that going to help me? They all have mm-hmm. the same growth rate, right? But in reality, you should be something grounded because you also know anywhere you go, you have a bunch of, you have a cul-de-sac here and then 500 meters to the right, you have council flats. Those properties are going to behave very differently over the next two years. They're not going to have the same growth rate, right? And it's, it's, it's getting to the point where you can actually be insightful for a home and yeah, sharing that data and getting people used to analyzing that data. I think it's a bit tricky because uh, for brokers or for advisors who could make a difference, right? There's regulation in between, right? And if you're taking this to actually give advice, then there has to be sense checks. And obviously if it's forward looking, right? Everyone's afraid because you can't do diligence. You can't analyze it, right? But uh, I think it's, a, it's an important piece of data that affects a big purchasing decision of most people's lives because it's what like 1 million 1 point something million transactions per year um and this is financially responsible for people not to look at it right mm-hmm. where the way you decide and stuff is fine but you should at least think about it. anyway rant over <laughs> moving on <laughs> and, then, and i get to be fair it's, it's clear how passionate you feel about it and i get and like i can sort of see that i can hear that and i and i get 
you're looking at this like from a different perspective to what people would look at it. And that's because of your background, your engineering background. You've not been in the mortgage broking world. You look at it from a different perspective, from a, yeah. a solution point of view, which is a great thing. Like that's the thing is like, this is the only way that the mortgage broking will change because, and that's why I talk about like new people quitting to industry and changing the way that the old school think and, and moving mortgage yeah. broking you're looking at lending and things like that, absolutely. But it's all relevant to the mortgage broking world. It, it certainly is. So we get we get how passionate you are about this data and sort of seeing it as a long term investment. But what? So do you want to just explain exactly what? Yeah, I know you alluded to a little bit in terms of the introduction, yeah. but do you want to just explain exactly what opportunity is and how it works and from a process point of view we'll cover on uh, the loads of questions that but do you want to just really sort of drill down in terms of what opportunity is sure so in the exact detail we are a second charge mortgage lender and our current product is an interest only equity loan fixed for five years so it's very similar to help to buy mm -hmm. if we're fca regulated they're not um and it kind of functions the same way, right? So the only difference is they don't charge an interest rate for five years. We do because we can't borrow money for free from the treasury yet. Maybe we could. <laughs> uh, <Yeah. laughs> but um, what will happen? So why do people use this, right? The biggest uh, limitation for first-time buyers is that you can only borrow four and a half times your income, uh, annual income, right? uh so like in my let's take my case for example right so i was earning 39k when i in 2013 and you take four and a half times that takes you to about 180k and i had 20k savings right and i need to get to 300k to be able to afford a one bedroom flat uh, at that time so what property can do in that situation is they can if the mortgage capped up at 180 they can lend over 180 uh, and our average loan size is about 50K, we can go up to 150. And for you to figure out how much you could borrow, and then they give me five, 50K extra, and then I can afford my, I put my deposit, it must be at least 5% over that. And uh, in this case would be what, 180 plus 50, 230, 250 in total. Uh, and then I'll end up paying an interest rate to the mortgage lender, to the first one, whatever it'd be about 800 quid, I think in that case of situation. And then I'll pay per opportunity uh, a monthly fee. So on average, our interest rate starts at like 6%, let's call it 7%. So if I borrow 50K, that's 7% per year. I only pay the interest. So that's 3,500. So just under 300 quid per month. Okay. Um, and But in reality, the total package is comparable to what you'd borrow at 95% from your bank. Uh, but now obviously you're borrowing more than four and a half times. And, um, and the reason is because the mortgage payment goes down because the first charge now doesn't lend you 95% of the house price. They lend you something like 75 mm -hmm. and 75% comes with a much better interest over what's the biggest loan, the 180 K you're borrowing. So that payment goes down. than if you're borrowing only from the bank and have a 5% deposit, and then you add our 300 quid on top and for that example, and then that's it. And then after five years, the interest rate becomes variable like most loans. Although at that point, customers usually have paid us back. After two years, they pay us back when they refix their main mortgage or uh, when they sell uh, the loan. Um, okay. And our loan is an equity loan. So effectively, if we gave you in that situation, if we gave you 50K out of 250, that's 20%. So when you pay us back, uh, you pay us at that point 20% of the new house price, right? So if your house okay. price has gone up a bit, then um, uh, we would take 20% of that and you would keep 80%, right? So the most of it. So let's say if the house goes to 300K, right? We would be 60K, so a fifth of 300. But your main mortgage would have stayed the same. Maybe it's a bit smaller because you paid it back. So instead of 180, now it's probably like 170. So we're 60 so in total, 230 mortgage. And so then you would have 70K. You put 20K in and all of a sudden you have 70K. So you made the most of it. We just mm -hmm. got 10K extra. Um, that's the product. Okay. I uh, uh, hope that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it makes, no, no it makes total sense. Like that, It does make total sense. I know you've sort of covered it because I talked about it being a five-year 
product is it then yeah. can and it's interest only so yes. can people pay like over like overpay in terms of paying monthly back or in, or can they do it like that way or is it a match of case of five years to whenever like it's a, a lump sum so what i'm trying to think is just understand whether it's a they can pay extra from a client point of view or is it matter of fact just a lump sum of in two years time right i want to pay it off now so and you can make do the rebalance it's a bit tricky because it's interest only, right? So you're not yeah, paying yeah. the principal monthly. You're paying just the interest. I think we uh -huh. can overpay up to... So disclaimers, I haven't... Uh, let me actually check this All right now. Uh, in essence, I think you can overpay once a year. Uh, okay. And if you overpay up to 10% more, it's fine. You don't get charged ERCs. If you go over that, you'll get charged some ERCs because we're giving you a five-year fixed interest. So therefore... Five. Uh, like any mortgage will charge some. So it's fine. And, yeah. and if you overpay, we calculate what that is percentage of the house price then, and we'll subtract that from the loan, and your interest payments will go down. And at the end, uh, we will get less of the house price. Right. You know what's less? Okay. That, so it's an annual thing, right? It's like it's something like an annual thing that you can do. Right? Yeah. yeah. In essence, That's you can, fine. I think customers pay us. Uh, we've had, we've been lending since 2018. Although, at, you know, at the beginning, you give a few and then you grow exponentially. Uh, so now we've seen some customers repay. It seems to be around two, three years they repay when they refix their main mortgage. Right, uh, okay. And they usually pay it all as a lump sum. Right, fine. Now that's, that makes I was just understanding what the options are from a guy. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense no, to do sure. the, the remortgage after two years or five years. And I throw on a five year deal, remortgage at the end of the five years. Yes. Borrow the extra, get the equity out, shall we say, pay you off. And then that's basically. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's interesting, right? Because like the more you start thinking. Because like we were talking earlier about the frustration, the passion, the et cetera. Like the reason I'm kind of frustrated and passionate about this as an engineer is because if you have this information, right, if you can look at it's the same thing as equity release, right? If you're if you think a bit, if you extrapolate yourself from the mortgage world, right? It's what this happened. This started about 150 years ago, more or less. Mortgages, like when building societies were formed, I think they celebrated 150 a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the history of mortgages, they haven't really changed. They're kind of like the uh, diesel or fuel engine, right? Optimization, yeah, yeah. same formula. Uh, I think the turbos of these formulas were the equity products. Right, that were added kind of in the last 20, 30 years, right? And you had some dodgy ones like the SAMs, <laughs> uh, and then you had some kind of more useful ones, right? Like uh, help to buy, and you have equity release, mm -hmm. right? There's there's multiple kind of um, there's multiple kind of products there, and I think the market's still experimenting. It doesn't really know what's going to stick in the long term, but I think what's what it is kind of alluding to is that wait, we have this extra income that we know about, right? That's come from the house, right? It's not just you making money when I have to do the affordability. The house is making money because if you think about it, that's the principle of equity release. You mm -hmm. don't need to pay me because the house pay me, pays me. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And this is the thing. The more we study that, the growth of the house price, the more we can create financial products that will benefit the consumer because I think the reason equity is playing a big chunk is because house prices will keep going up, right? No matter what we do, because it's just a finite planet and more population, fine, we'll make some more money. But in reality, you always have richer people somewhere else that buy property and then that kind of offsets the local laws. Um, yeah. but long story short, houses always go, go faster than salaries. Maybe that gets solved, but I don't think so. And therefore, the only way to catch up is either for banks to like completely relax loan to income, uh, but I think that could be dangerous, mm -hmm. or to analyze, okay, what other income sources do we have and try to use that in the equation, right? And I think what we're trying to do is that, because I feel like if I can see a house is going to be much uh, more expensive in a few years, obviously for me as a lender, that means that it's a safer proposition and therefore I could lend more, right? And for mm -hmm. us, it's just a bit frustrating that, it's so hard to push this through, right? The, there's so many little 
fragments layers, of the industry and, and all of them with yeah. their little habits and their regulation that reinforces the habits to keep everything safe. And I think what's fundamentally interesting, it doesn't seem to be anyone looking at the top that actually calculates the risk impact of certain decisions, right? Like if there was a chief risk officer of the whole formula and says, what would happen if interest rates go up 2%? Or what would happen if we remove this LTI, right? And there's Bank of England that does a bit of that, but there's so much fear and so much kind of like, don't tweak it too much. Like they move interest rate by 25 bips and the whole world loses it, right? And it's front page. That it feels like for me, it feels like that's what makes innovation so hard. Because no little piece of the puzzle can calculate the ramifications of one decision change. And therefore, anyone, everyone's afraid to change, right? And most of the decisions that are being made at big banks or small banks or wherever is tweak a bit the pricing just so we keep our market share, mm-hmm. right? In the spring and in the autumn. But no one's actually saying, oh, we should create this totally new product because maybe that helps people. Mm-mm, mm-mm. Let someone else do it. If it's successful after 10 years, we'll buy it and incorporate it, right? Yeah. And, exactly. and it's frustrating because it's affecting so many people's lives. And on the other hand, you have the newspapers for the last 20 years saying every week, oh, the people can't buy again anymore, right? Compared to their parents. And so, so like so much whining, so little doing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I wish the balance would change a bit. <laughs> yeah. And, and it must be frustrating because like we, like I said, the red tape, the fragments, the, the, the layers of trying to get things have changed from a, an industry that is, it's frustrating. Like I, I, I can see your frustration. I feel your frustration because it, from, the out, from the outside looking in, it is when you want change to happen, it's like, well, yeah. this is for the, this is good. This is for the benefit. And they understand like with regulation, there's certain things got to go to, but nobody yeah. looks at, no, people just go, oh no, we have, we've never done that before. So let's just, don't even try and work a fix around it. It's just literally just yeah. dismissed. And that must be, I can see the frustration. But it must be, it must be a, yeah. like, a massive frustration because it, it makes total sense. And like in terms of, from a product point of view, from a consumer yeah. point of view, helps me get on the ladder. And I know that like, we've got various things going on with the government right now with regards yeah. to leaders and politics and their, their sort of the campaigns they're doing and whatever things are going on. But actually, this does get in calm and it does make sense. I, I, I purposely not done any research before our conversation <laughs> on the on the because these are the sort of things I want to experience while I'm talking to yeah. you. But I get it. Like I do get what you're trying to, and I get your frustration because yeah. actually this would this could benefit. This could like yeah, because there, there is yeah. second charge mortgages out there already in the marketplace, but with not really there's a bit of due diligence in there, but not really. So it's just bringing it all together and seeing it as the future of they're not too worried about the future of the, the the 20 years 30 years time they're just worried about what's in the front of the face of now and but there are there, the, whether things change it's just a matter of keep well you must got massive persistence you must have a massive amount of motivation and drive i think because like in terms of uh, giving up and thinking we'll move on to something else then You've, you've persevered with this for, for quite some time so far but you're getting buying people are you people are using your product is that Brokers, is that clients coming to direct? Is that networks? Is where where's where are you gaining traction right now? Yeah, no, true. Uh, it's a it's a combination of all of the above. So we have customers right. coming to um, so we have a website for opportunity, and they come there, and it's it's where we offer them the tech as well. So you can go on our website, and we pull all the properties from Zoopla, and we kind of score them based on how overvalued, undervalued, and in a growth area, we think they are, and we give that information to customers for free, right? Okay. So they can figure out, okay, based on income deposit, what kind of budget could I be hoping for? And therefore, what can I afford? And then you can slide and say, oh, I want a two bedroom, at least 60 square meters or something like that. And we pull down all the properties and then you can see which ones are overvalued, undervalued. Because, And we do that for free because half of our team was in their steps a few years ago and we wish we had this. Wow. And Plus, it's also in our interest, right? Because if they make a better financial decision, then we give an equity loan on a property that can do better. And um, so it's a win-win situation. Absolutely. And um, then uh, once they kind of figure out their home and negotiate and or whatever they do to get the offer accepted, 
then they go to a mortgage broker and the broker looks and sees, okay, is it um, uh, for what could they get without opportunity, right? What could they get with opportunity and presents it like all of our brokers are full of market brokers, right? And they present it to the customer. And then if the customer chooses property or the broker recommends opportunity plus whatever it is, Halifax, Tipton, uh, et cetera, uh, they uh, apply for both mortgages in parallel uh, okay. in the background and customer doesn't really feel much of a difference because they only have to give one payslip and one piece of document to the broker and the broker does two in the background. And we use the same solicitor as the main lender. So again, no duplication oh, okay. of work and then they complete and then they, I think we have a promotional we st- I don't know if we still have it, but we used to give people like, a, at least in London, you can get a zip, people get a zip van to move, right? You rent wow, a, okay. your own van and we gave them a free voucher for one day's worth of zip van and a champagne right. when they move in to just say thanks for kind of trusting us and being a opportunity customer. And I think then Bob's your uncle. You can pop the champagne and put your feet on the living room table if you have one and then uh, done. Enjoy your new home. Yeah, yeah. And I think... Uh, yeah, so that's kind of it. And look, we have a lot of plans to make it much better. And I think we specifically copied Hub to Buy when we created this product because we realized there's a lot of, not aversion to innovation, but let's say innovation takes a long time. So we wanted to make sure we can do some, the banks already knew how to handle this and the brokers and the lenders and, and the uh, lawyers, etc. So that was our current product. And then from your question of do we work with real estate agents and brokers? We do. I think we have about 2,000 brokers, advisors from different firms signed up. Not that many networks. We're looking to grow a few more. Feels to be a bit of a push for the mortgage broker network world now to find kind of help to buy alternatives when they go as the lenders are looking for that and um, I think the builders are pushing a bit for that. Uh, so um, hopefully we'll be a bit more. If you have any ideas on how to uh, navigate that field, would be very open. No, I think I think that's it. It's just it, getting buying from the the brokers. You've got to look at both sides of it, like the de- the directly authorized firms that are out there, and, and yeah. having wins with with the directly authorized firms, and then the quicker wins volume wise are the networks. So when you look at the bigger networks, the smaller ones, it's cracking the bigger networks is, will take time and things like that. But once you've got those cracked, then you've got a, a marketplace with regards to the, the bigger networks. And then the smaller ones, they're the, they can be the quicker wins because then you're dealing with the, the maybe like a network with only sort of a, a certain number of smaller number of firms, which then getting into those people. And I think it's just, it's always the same thing. It's just about education. It's just that's all it is. It's just brokers understanding that this is a regulated product. This is something that is heavily regulated. There is the process makes sense. You understand it from a client journey point of view. It's about how it's always about options. Into that's I always talk about. It's, it's all about having options. So if I'm a broker sat here and bank and mum and dad doesn't work or they can't equity release or they can't do various things and is yeah. this another option? Absolutely. I think it's just it's how you go about educating the brokers to then talk about the other options out there. So it's good that you've got yeah, several totally thousand agree. already. So and that's it. Like it's, you've got several that like you've got a good amount of brokers on there, but it's just about which is very like having the persistence to keep banging on the drum, keep talking about it, keep promoting it as a is it's ultimately as long as the brokers understand it i think that's the main thing is like it's just understanding actually what the product is and once they understand the product once they understand the process yeah then it's just like it makes sense to them and i think that's the sort of thing is that with what you're trying to do is there's a bit of a no i totally agree i totally agree craig i think you're right i think there's a there's a bit of a mindset shift though from what we've seen the process because kind of speaking to multiple people and having been in conversations with these kind of networks. I think there's a bit of a change that at some point I think is going to have to be made, which is from the way, especially if you have a bit of more automated process of processing leads and just going through, there's a, the questions seem to be, uh, okay, give me your details. 
and then let me see what works for you in terms of the best interest rate, more or less, right? You have a table of mortgage lenders. Yeah. And then it outputs something which for most people my age or younger um, isn't good enough from an affordability perspective, especially in this current environment, right? Um, and, but brokers, there isn't a point in the process where you get asked, oh, do you want to know what mortgages you have afford, uh, uh, affordable and what's the cheapest rate or cheapest payment or whatever? Or do you want to look at what's most affordable? What, 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 how much can you afford? If that makes sense, right? Because if yeah, you yeah. go in the London and countries and all of this, the system is kind of geared to say, oh, okay, give me all the criteria or details. I'll put it into the machine and then it will punch out effectively a price comparison website. Right. And I'll just start at the top. Yeah. But if that solution doesn't work for a big variety of people, and from what we're understanding, most of these big processing uh, kind of like online uh, or lead generators for MAP or NNC or whatever it is, right, from the mortgage calculators online, about 40% of them fail. It's not fail. What's the word? When you have like leads you can't service effectively, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. People you can't help. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's pretty bad. Right. Cause it's, it's kind of one and two. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think currently what we're seeing, a lot of the system is focused on, okay, I have 50, 60%. I can't help. Let's help these guys. And then the rest are dead. Yeah. Just thrown to right? the wayside. Absolutely. And, and, and that's wrong. Cause they're not bad people. A lot of them I think are still prime, right? They just can like me, right. They could afford 200 K and they needed 300 K. Right. And what's worse is nowadays there are solutions. And I agree, like today, maybe we're, we're a bit niche, right? We're not the nationwide of this world. But doesn't it feel a bit wrong when you're saying, oh, there's nothing we can do when you know there is something you could do, right? Especially to your point, we're regulated. It's not like, oh, there's this guy that had an idea somewhere in the middle of nowhere. It's like, I don't know. There's a couple. And there's multiple options, right? So I think there's a bit of that order of questions of hey actually maybe society needs to think about how much can can they afford more with and maybe it's with us maybe it's a mainstream solution at some point whatever it is but i think that should slightly happen because i don't see that carrying through in most of these organizations no no absolutely right it's more of looking at they say oh brokers will it's just based on volume. So a lot of those things by thinking, well, I can help half the customers that come through my door and I can't help the other ones, other half. Well, I'll just focus on the half I can help and just put to the wayside the ones I can't help. It's, it is, that's criminal to me because it's, like I said, if there's an option out there for a client, <clears throat> to me, you can make a, this, you help those people, the half that you feel that you can't help or just don't take that box, you then help those people, they will be clients for life because they will be so much so loyal to you yeah. in terms of you as a mortgage broker. Whereas the ones that, the half that you did, you will, some of those will be clients for life, absolutely. But, but some they know of they can go somewhere else. And exactly. It's very easy. Yeah. They don't feel the pain, so they don't appreciate the service. No. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's just rate. It's just, just rate chases. That's all they are. Like, well, you can't offer me the best rate now. They kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to go there kind of thing. So, whereas... Yeah. Those the loyal ones, you really stuck you and really busted a good good to help them. They will be clients for life, and they will recommend people, okay. and you get more referrals and stuff like that because you've actually helped them out. You've 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 gone at yeah. it a little bit, sort of not gone for the lower hanging fruits, which is sometimes yeah. when you're mortgage broken, you've got volume. It's like you just go for the lower hanging fruits. That is just oh, like, that's natural insta instinct. However, yeah, yeah. but the, but for the people that. But I don't it's think not it should be one versus the other, right? You should have yeah. some sort of division that focuses. Because, like, on the other hand, those are customers you've already paid for, right? You yeah, have a lead generator or whatever. They're there, and you have the details, right? You can wait for the new ones who are going to come through the door next month, right? But, like, Glengarry and Frost, right? The leads are here, <laughs> right? You have them. You use them. Uh, it's Absolutely. bad for business to not try to create value from that. Right, Definitely. even if it's just a referral towards someone else and say, "Hey, look, these guys could help you, maybe." Um, yeah. um, but um, look, I, I I think it's going the right. Sorry, I don't want to be negative. I'm sometimes unconscious. I'm Eastern European, and I see as an engineer, I see problems, not necessarily solutions. I think it's changing. I think help to buy kind of help 
put up a bit of stamp of approval on solutions like this. And now by going, it's creating a bit of momentum and people looking at solutions. I think Help Dubai maybe also created a bit of dissent, <laughs> something the government kind of forced the industry to do. So I don't know yeah. if the industry likes it that much, but uh, it's it, it, we're going in the right track, right? It's just like frustrating that every month that we don't move faster, there are thousands of people that don't get homes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, that is the thing is like, is, and that's what the end goal you've got to focus on is the people getting homes, the people like you, like the experience you had several years ago. Yeah. And these thousands of people going through that same experience day in, day out of like the computer says, no, yeah. we'll move on to the next one. And you're just pushed by the wayside. It, it yeah. is criminal. Like it is criminal that that happens because, and that it will change. I, honestly, I believe it has to change and, and will change and things like this, the, the industry will have to look at what it does and it's not very the sort of the very much a half people we can help half we can't and those half we can't help will become half will be will move into the other side of the fence in five years time 10 years time 20 years time but like that's not right for them right now they want to they want to start again on the ladder they sort of want to build in their own like and build in their equity and the rest of it so um so like if, excellent. if you can if you can't help them now they're going to have to wait for, let's say, a year. They wait until next year. Interest rates are definitely going to be more expensive. So it's only going to be even worse for them. Right? So, yeah, yeah no, I, that's why we have, we have our mission to our team, right? And it's visionary. It's where we have a lot to do. But our mission is to help 1 million people become homeowners by 2030 right okay uh, wow. and like every i try to steer the team every time we have like important decisions to be made i'm like okay which option a does that get us closer or option b right and that's kind of the prism for which we make important decisions can we have more people right. sooner um right. but let's see we'll see i was gonna that was gonna be my final question what the future looks like but i'm guess you're gonna be focused on what you've just talked about there of helping getting the million people. I think that's, that's a big thing. Well, yeah. And we're trying to create better products, right? So from um, this product we've had, right, we've been like one dream we have, and it's, it's not easy. And I think this market environment is not making it any easier is to go for a 0% a deposit mortgage. Right. So, uh, cause like in my mind, again, I was just as a mathematician, is there that much difference between 95 and hundred? Or fine, not zero. Let's do ninety-eight, right? Or ninety-nine. And we, my my co-founder and I, dream, dreamed that for a while, and then um, we're working on that. And let's see how long it's going to take us. Uh, but uh, that would be nice because then effectively you can make buying at a similar cost to renting, right? Because you'll just have maybe you pay stamp duty at the beginning, but then you'll just have a monthly cost to buying, right? And all of a sudden it's not, oh, I have to put 50K or zero. It's like, oh, it's kind of zero to do that. And I think that could be transformational because there's a lot of people who don't buy today because they just don't think they can and they keep renting, right? But if you can make it at the same cost, I think those people might move. And then the second product we're thinking about doing is um, rent to own as we're seeing for the customers we're getting, right? About a third we can help with our product, a third we could help if we had 0% deposit mortgage, and a third just because of citizenship, right? Because now since Brexit, you know, right? If you don't have ILR or full citizenship, a lot of them can't apply for a mortgage for a while. Mm -hmm. That takes five years. Uh, or lower credit score, it feels like this is the next best option, right? Rent while you're the rent kind of saves for your deposit and we guarantee you can buy the house at a certain price in a few years. So you can start buying furniture, build a life, right? Knowing that that option is there. So that's, that's something we like to do and we're thinking about, right? Uh, that's kind of what I say is on the horizon, but we have a lot of other quirky ideas uh, in the background. Um, but uh, yeah, it's helping as many people become homeowners and then trying to help them to unlock the equity in their home as well once they do to give them more options. I think this, to be fair, we, we've gone on for quite some time now and I think oh. we could, go, but that's a good thing. Honestly, I feel as though like we, we could get you back on the podcast and talk about more and talk about the future and talk about certain <laughs> products and things sorry, like that. Honestly, there's, yeah, there's, no, much. do not apologise. Absolutely not at all. No, because there, wow. there, like for me, 
it's clear that you're trying to change an industry that is, I know there's a lot of brokers out there that don't want the industry to change because it's been their security for all their life. It's how they've always done things. It's how it's always been. People don't like change. But then there are a lot of brokers out there who are getting new into the industry, who are working on social media, doing like various things they're trying to do to build their yeah. own business. And, they, and we'll gladly work with these types of clients to then help them become long-term clients. So there's, and that's a criminal thing with it. It's like these people will be, there's brokers out there who are trying to build a business. And then yeah. we've got firms out there that will just throw away half the lead generation because they can't help them today kind of thing. And that's the, that's the criminal part of it. And it's just trying to piece that together. So there's yeah. absolutely loads more things we can talk about. And I'm interested to sort of see how this goes. So, not next week, but like probably like in several months' time. But we, if, if you've got time, it'd be good to get you back on the podcast and talk about where you've gone and where it's going and what's changed and things like that. Because I think I'm excited about to see where this is going because it's ch- what's the motivation for me is and what the exciting thing is, is you're trying to change an industry. And that's a big thing for me as well is trying to change this industry and how it works and making life easier for brokers, making it better for yeah. clients, the whole journey from a client point of view to home ownership, which is ultimately the goal. So yeah. absolutely. But in th- so thank you so much for your time. Thank you to Green to be on the podcast. It's been an absolute, I've loved t- talking to you and hearing more yeah. about you, like you and your passion and clearly seeing your passion and feeling your passion to what we do. We will obviously tag you in to on when we release the podcast, like, sure. People reaching out to you is like go to the website, which will give people the website on the on tagging. So do you want to just yeah, reach out to you? Is that the best way? Yeah, I think reach at contact at opportunity.com and uh, then uh, multiple teams have access to that and they're reading it. So they can uh, we can we can respond because if it's just me, I think they won't be inundated. <laughs> they might not be able to <laughs> yeah. respond. But if I'm, I'm contact there's multiple people, so you'll definitely get the quickest response. Um, and yeah. Thank you, Craig. Like, really appreciate it. And it's nice to um, to have the opportunity to do this and to share our thoughts. Brilliant. No, thank you so much for your time. And I've literally been enjoyable. It's been great to not have an agenda. I never worry about content of it going on <laughs> because I always tend to find that being that way, we, I just ask something and away you go. So that would be brilliant from that point of view. But thank you so Perfect. much for your time. Perfect. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye.